Good afternoon, everyone. I see some familiar names now popping up on the top of the screen. So if this is your second, third or fourth session of the day, you're especially welcome. Thanks for joining us the whole day. Um, so this session is called What Your Leadership Team Really Want from IS and Cyber. We wanted to get the year off to a good start by giving you these free sessions so you can learn new practical skills and give you a taster of what our programmes are like. The session will be 90 minutes. There's a Q&A at the end. Um, your microphones will be off the whole time. So if you want to ask a question, just pop it in the chat. And any questions that we don't get to answer, we'll record them and share them on our YouTube and social media channels by the end of the week. And we'll send out an email with all that info in it afterwards. Um, so throughout the day, we've been sharing posts on LinkedIn and Twitter. If you comment on any of them or you leave us a Google review, you're in with a chance of winning a tech backpack from Madlog. And I've shared the link in the chat to that. If you do all three, you've got three chances of winning, so that would be great. Um, so on to the important stuff. Uh, Sean's going to be the trainer today. He's the founder at Nemstar, um, and he will guide us through this session to help us pivot the board around our way of thinking. Sean. Thank you very much, Johan. OK, and uh, well done to those people who have suffered me uh, all day today. We are doing a free training January, as Johan said, and uh, some people have joined us uh, all day and this will be their fourth session. So tip of my hat to you. Uh, well done if you've stuck with us all day. I hope it's been useful. If you haven't, if this is your first or second session, welcome uh, in. Uh, we promised and we advertised that these sessions would be real learning, no marketing, no sales. And we've tried to very hard to stick to that. So today's session is what your leadership team really wants from IS and cyber. And the sort of subtitle, help your board get a grip on IS and cyber risk. The sort of last two sessions we did, the previous one was on practical risk management and this session, they, they very much tied together. There's a big link between risk and what your board really wants. I actually think out of all the sessions we've delivered today, this is the most important. OK, I need to come up with a more jazzy title for it, because out of all the sessions, I think this is actually our lowest number session out of all the free sessions we run. So thank you for coming, because I really do think there are some really important and simple lessons that you can take away from this. One. This is the one that I am maybe most passionate about the one that can make the biggest difference to your organization, your security posture and your leadership team. OK, so. When we normally do a topic like this, it is normally a workshop. You normally have a smaller number of people in it and it is my role to start a conversation and the conversation is around this. What issues prevent your board from delivering effective information security? Now, you'll notice some key things in here because I'm trying to get you to change the way. Johan uh, used the word pivot. I think that's a great word to use. And the word in here is board. It's your board delivers information security. That, that's the first really important thing. We're trying to get you to pivot away from the idea that this is an IT function or a technical function or a function for a SOC. No, it's not. It's the board's responsibility to deliver everything in an organization. And one of those things that they have to deliver is information security. So I have asked this question to boards. I've asked it to public bodies, I've asked it at conferences, I've asked it on birds of the feller and get togethers. And we always get a range of answers. The answers can be anything. The answers can be, look, it's not understood. They, they don't know how serious this is. 
There's a lack of transparency between the board asking for X and IT seems to deliver Y. There's no clear plan. I think that's a really important one. You know, this concept that the board simply says, fix this, take this away and fix it. No. Do you know, we need a plan. Well, without a plan, how can we accomplish anything? So we need a clear plan. Too expensive. How many times have you heard that? But of course, I don't think any of these are valid excuses. They're all excuses. But I don't think they're reasons. We shouldn't be accepting these excuses. It's not their job. One of my favourite pet hits. The board turning around and saying, it's not our job to do this. We, we hired a team of people to do it. You know, we, we hired Lisa and our far wall team. And Lisa, Lisa should be doing it. It's not us. It's Lisa. You know, how many excuses? We fixed it last year. What do, you, what do you mean when you fix it again this year? We give you a budget last year. You told me you fixed it. We're not a bank. Come on, you must have heard that one from somebody in your company, somebody in your career at some stage. What do we need to do this for? We're not a bank. Banks need to do this, not us. And the magic bullet approach. The magic bullet approach is that fix it last year. It's not their job. The magic bullet is that vendor come in. That vendor sold us a new box with blue LED flashing lights. And we spent a lot of money on those blue LED flashing lights. And the vendor told us this new box, which was expensive, it fixes the problem. We know none of those are acceptable. Our job is to try to work out how to change this. So that instead of saying, you know, these are the reasons why we don't do it. We need to change these and solve these literally one at a time so that we do actually achieve something. And that's what we want to look at on this final session on our free training January. How can we approach the board to help them, to support them, to mentor them, to change the way they view this. And there are systems, there are processes, just like there are technical controls. There are tools and methods that we can apply that may help you achieve that result. It isn't going to be quick. And it's going to be different for every company, depending on your size and your scale and, and how many of these issues you have. Sometimes you can do this in six months. Sometimes it takes six years or more, okay? But the bigger an organization, the slower it is to change. So these are the things we're trying to deal with on this session. You see, it's all about traditional IT security versus information security. IS versus IT. See, there's what we should have called it. IT versus IS, the smackdown. You think we get more people to attend? You see, it's really two alternative views of how to approach this problem. One of the views, I call this the organic view. This is where if you naturally progress through and you mature and you grow, you end up with an organic solution. An organic solution is not one somebody sits down and deliberately designs. Organically, you get there slowly, you know? And if you do it, the first department that ever came to the business and said, we need a firewall, was the IT team, Lisa and our IT team. The business didn't come to IT and say, I think we need a firewall. It was Lisa and her IT team came to the business and said, we need a firewall. It was Lisa and her IT team came to the business and said, we need backups. 
It wasn't the other way around. We want to look at the strengths and weaknesses between a traditional organic IT security model that many of you will have and what COVID suggests, an information security team, an information assurance team, a different way to approach the problem. You see, the traditional approach, it's an IT problem and we need a LISA solution. Traditional IT security is about restricting what users can do, preventing attacks taking place, denying access to bad actors and blocking dangerous websites. The problem is, well, what is the problem? It's quite effective. I mean, ISO 27000 to me is a very traditional IT security approach. So, you know, does it work? Well, it sort of works, doesn't it? It does effectively reduce risk. Lisa and a team do a great job. The firewall configuration's good, they've got good antivirus, they've got ransomware protection. I mean, Lisa and her team, they're technically competent, they've got the trust of the business, and they know what they're doing. And it's true, they do technically know what they're doing. But there's limitations to it. Every time we put in these IT security controls, what we're effectively doing is reducing something that's really important to the business, something that Lisa and her IT team don't do a lot of talking about. Oh, they do very little talking, but didn't turn the pen on. But how many IT people do you actually hear talking about return on investment? Business people talk about return on investment. IT people tend not to. You see, the business purchased IT systems originally to give themselves a strategic objective I used to love many, many years ago interviewing staff and I had a load of interview questions that I loved asking. If you ever end up in a job interview with me, I might ask you what sounds like an impossible question. What's the purpose of IT? That's it. You're going for a job in IT or cyber or security and I usually ask the same question. What is the purpose of an IT department? And you get back all sorts of answers. There only can be one. If you work in a private sector company, the purpose of IT is to increase in profitability and nothing else. Because if you work in a private sector for-profit company, there is a single goal to achieve a profit. If you work in a charity or not-for-profit sector, it's to achieve your strategy to create stakeholder and shareholder value. You see, IT is not simply there to run IT anymore. It's there to make sure there's a return on investment. And every single time you restrict what a system can do, you turn something off, you reduce that ROI. I learned this in the most sort of explicit example you can give. It was an audit for a large academic institution in the United Kingdom. This academic institution had suffered a number of successful ransomware attacks in rapid succession. The Board of Governors had pulled together the IT leaders, the head of IT, 
the IT manager, the IT director, and the information security manager. And they got the group of the four of them together after the third successful attack. And they told them, this can never happen again. It's obvious you don't know what you're doing. If this ever happens again, we're going to sack the lot of you. The board was convinced, for good reason, that this team could not deliver what they wanted. They asked for an audit to be conducted. I was one of the auditors. What we found in this educational establishment was exceptional security, really strong IT security. They had fantastically configured firewalls, they filtered, they restricted, they blocked everything. And there was very, very little chance that another ransomware attack was going to be successful. So you're thinking to yourself, well, there you go, they know what they're doing. But I have a photograph, a photograph of a place that they called their drill hall. Their drill hall was a shared computing facility. The, the uh, educational establishment had invested several million pounds in making the shared computing facility. It was a beautiful Gothic room in the establishment. It had about what, 300 computers? There were fancy Apple iMacs and floating screens. There were beautiful desks, LED backlit, uh, ergonomic chairs. It was uber high tech in this really old Gothic uh, room. And I have a photograph of a student in front of every single computer working away flat out on their laptops, because you know what they've done? They pushed the fancy computers out of the way. And they were using this multiple million pound facility as a hot desk. Because at the start of each year, each lecturer got up and said, welcome to my course. To do my course, you need a laptop. Because the college system you couldn't do anything on it. Internet was so tied down, you couldn't browse the internet. They banned all social media, all personal email. They had restricted USB drives, CD-ROMs, floppy disks. In actual fact, if you put information on a college system, the only place you could access it from was the college. You couldn't do it from home in your digs. You couldn't cooperate with other people on it. They had taken a multi-million pound IT system and effectively made it useless. Because the strategy, the purpose of an educational establishment is education. And if the IT system is no good for education, and the IT system is not fulfilling its purpose and it does not have a return on investment. You see, whose fault was this? And you can answer that question in so many different ways, can't you? It wasn't really IT's fault. IT, as far as they were concerned, they done what the board had asked them to do. Never let this happen again. If you want to never have a successful attack, you want to bring risk as close to zero as you possibly can. To do that, you bring the usability and functionality close to zero. They're tied together. Security goes hand in hand with functionality and usability. It's like a seesaw. Every time you raise information security, what happens? Functionality and usability. It's more difficult to use. There's less features. There's more restrictions. You know how this feels. 
Okay. How many of you are watching this session today on your own personal device? Because the work system won't let you connect to my Teams chat. Teams is Microsoft. It's pretty harmless. But the number of people, the number of people who have to do exams on their own personal computers because work systems don't let them do it. You see, traditional IT security does effectively reduce risk. But risk, are you ready? Risk is not bad. I always feel when you're doing a course like this, it's almost like a therapy session. Repeat after me. Risk is good. Go on. Let's hear you say it. Because it's true. Risk is good. From a business perspective, risk is not something to be eliminated. Risk drives profit. It drives a return on investment. Our issue is technical people are very binary. We learn binary. We are told everything in computing is binary. When Lisa went to university, she studied binary. She studied TCP IP. She might have even programmed in binary. Everything to an IT person is very on or off, true or false. It either works or it doesn't. It's fixed or it's broke. Think about Lisa's IT service desk. If a service is broke, the service desk fixes it because the service can only have two states, working, not working. It's a binary view of the world. If you give this to an IT, and sometimes even an IST, then if you give them a problem, what they're going to try to do is to fix the problem. You can't fix security. You can't resolve it. You can't fix it. Because in between risk and opportunity lies something really important to me. Profit. I run a little business. I left my job in BT to form this business in 2009. I took a, a risk. Businesses live on taking risks. Capitalism is supposed to be, a, I know capitalism is a little bit broke these days, but capitalism is making a profit for taking a risk. You know, if you borrow money from a bank, the bank's taking a risk and lending you that money. They lend you the money so you can build a house or start a business. And depending how big a risk you are, they charge you a different rate of interest. Risk and reward go together. The bigger a risk the bank takes, the more interest they charge, the bigger a reward they need. A good business person would be absolutely astonished at the concept. Risk is bad because it isn't bad. We take risks all the time in order to create profits. Even if you work for a not-for-profit or charity sector, people who donate money, your grant givers, they take a risk giving you that money, trying to take a risk that you will spend it effectively. I'm a taxpayer. I proudly pay my taxes in order to get my public services. I take a risk that if I pay my tax, the government will work out efficient processes to deliver me effective public services. It's a risk that I take. Information security is not broke. The business uses IT despite the risks. The risks are not something to be fixed. We choose to use it despite the risk. What we need is an adequate level of protection. Adequate. How many times have you heard that word in an IT department? Is the security adequate? Adequate security is exactly what we want. Not too much, not too little, adequate. 
many times have you ever heard an IT person talk about that? We can't fix it. You see, what we need to do is we need to work with the senior leadership team. We need to educate them. We need to support them. We need to explain this problem in a language they understand. The entire last session on practical risk, which will be up on our YouTube channel, was all about that. Translation. Making sure the business understands it. Make sure that the business understands if you want to use information technology, there is an inherent risk. We can spend some money to make the inherent risk a little bit smaller, but we are never going to, nor should we try to bring it to zero. And think about this. How many people die on the roads of the UK every year? If you actually thought about it too much, you might change your mind the next time you go out to your car. Because every single time you get in your car, you take a risk. It's not just you, it's not just your car, it's other drivers are the risk as well. And you risk your life every single time, but it doesn't stop us doing it. When you're driving a car and you want to overtake somebody, you take a big risk in doing that. You pull out from behind another car and look at all the things you've got to take into account. You take that risk usually without thinking. Sometimes, very rarely I hope, you get wrong a little bit. Ooh, ooh, you get a little bit too close for comfort. A risk was too high. Some of you might even have went over that threshold. I hope not too many of you have had accidents, but it's a risk we're willing to take. You see, a business can have two things they don't want. This is what your senior management team want. They do not want too much risk. Because if you have too much risk, you're going to get compromised. You're going to lose a huge amount of money. You're going to get data stolen. Too much risk or too many control. They're as bad as each other. One is every bit as bad as another one. I actually have found more and more companies doing this these days. Too many controls. They tie themselves down. They restrict what people can do. And that might work from an IT security perspective. The question is, does it work from a business perspective? You see, you can have too much risk or too many controls. And of course, neither is the right answer for a profit, for a profitable business. And it's that word a profitable business. You see, as a for-profit company, we have a single goal to make a reasonable profit. That was the word reasonable. If you're greedy and go for an excessive profit, hopefully your customers will punish you. And some companies are risk adverse. Some companies don't expand because they don't know how to take risks. Some companies take too many, some companies take too little. The one you'd want to invest your pension in is the one that's taking a reasonable amount of risk for a reasonable return. That's a sustainable business. Companies that go for massive boom usually go boom and bust. And companies that are risk adverse usually don't grow. You see, two things we don't want. So what do we want? Well, what we do want is something that works. And the first thing we have to agree, traditional IT security when Lisa tells the company what to do and tries to fix the broken information security does not work. Well, the problem is it does work up to a certain point. So it appears to work at the start, appears to be really good, but it doesn't really deliver what the company needs. And what I need to explain this to you for, and I know this is the reason why you've attended today, because it's 
the big exciting thing on this and I can't wait. We need an inverted yield curve. I know it's exciting, isn't it? I love my inverted yield curves. What the hell is an inverted yield curve? I hear you all scratching your head. And why are we covering it on an information security course? Because it's not about information security. It's about business. What we have is business risk on the left hand side, increasing business risk, decreasing business risk. And across the bottom, we have traditional IT security controls. Less control, less expenditure, more controls, better security. So the traditional view would be better, 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 better. And let's plot some points on this. Let's go in and plot where different companies will appear in this graph. So the easy one is if you have, whoops, I accidentally touched the screen there. If you have, if you have very few security controls, then obviously your risk is going to be very high. So if you have very few security controls, your risk will be up here somewhere. Let's call this, for example, a P1, point one. As you increase the amount of controls on your IT system, guess what? Your risk goes down. So up here, we might have increased the controls. We might get something like P2. And you continue to increase the controls, then you'll get a small improvement to the risk. You'll get something like P3. And it all looks rosy. Until we do P4. Because you continue to increase controls, you end up with risk going back up again. What? Yes, you do. You end up with risk going back up again because this is not IT risk. It's business risk. And what we end up with, if I can try, I'm going to try my best, see if my math professor will be proud of me. I'm going to try my best to, that's not too bad, is it? To do that, it's an inverted yield curve. Because it's about profitability. Here are four companies all competing in the same marketplace. They all produce banner stands. The first thing I see in this side of the room is a banner stand. So we've got four companies in Belfast and they all produce banner stands. You know the stands you've got at conferences and stuff. P1 is a promiscuous company. The first company has got very little IT security controls and they have a massive risk. And you know what? They're not really a competitor because they're going to get hacked. They're going to lose data. Their system's going to be offline. They're going to get ransomware. GDPR commissioner, information commissioner is going to find them. I'm not worried about them. I'm also not worried about P4. P1. Roadrunner.com. P1 is Roadrunner. P4, Wild Eye Coyote. Wild Eye Coyote has the best possible security. The system is so tight. They're spending their profits on security controls. Their system is so locked down. Their sales staff can't do online demos. They can't, I send them a picture. There's too much hassle. They can't accept pictures through email. I have to go on some sort of secure system, create a user account. I, I can't be bothered. I'm a customer. They're, I don't want a military grade banner. I just want one that works. You see, Naller, the P1 or the P4 are competitive companies. Even if you're a not-for-profit and a charity, it works in exactly the same way. You're losing too much money. You're spending too much money. 
There's no return on investment. Nobody can use your IT systems. In actual fact, where I want to be is somewhere in here. So you're writing your chat box. It's going to ask you this. What do you call this area? This area that I've shaded, it's actually got a name. The name has got something to do with a children's fairy tale story and astrophysics. The clue is a children's fairy tale story and astrophysics. Johan, anybody get this one? Well, in your chat boxes, what do you think you call this area? Something to do with children's fairy tale story and astrophysics on the chat boxes. Anybody? What do you call very it? Very quiet, Sean. <laughs> it's gone very quiet. Why is that? Is the chat box working? Oh, we've got ah, Goldilocks. Thing. Somebody got it. Very good. You're right. A Goldilocks zone. Goldilocks, the three birds. Too cold. Too hot. Just. Right, it's the sweet spot. <laughs> the Goldilocks zone. Goldilocks zone in astrophysics is a planet that's not too close to a sun to evaporate water and not too far away from a sun to have frozen water. If you want to support life, you support it in the Goldilocks zone, the right distance away from a sun to support liquid water. That's where it comes from. Look, I know we can't be here. I know. We can't be here. Do you know what I don't know? Whereabouts in here is perfect. Somewhere in here, and you know where it is. You can draw an axe on it, but it's very hard to achieve. Whoops, sorry. Uh, that's my countdown timer. We had this screen on so long today, it's got an automatic power save. Okay, the hit that we're taking, the bit that we want to know, we want to be here. That, that's where maximum profit is. It ends up looking like a face, doesn't it? Okay, that's where maximum profit is. I don't know how to get you to here. I know as a good information security manager, I shouldn't allow you to do that, and I shouldn't allow you to do that. But it's up to us to work with the business to get that sweet spot and a balance in between. Okay, you need a magic number to not pass. It. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, somebody's a mathematician. Very good. Okay, so we need to get that sweet spot balance of it all. Do you see what I'm trying to explain? It's not about too little security. It's not about too much security. It's about achieving a balance because that is where you make the most profit. And as a charity or public sector, that is where you deliver maximum value. Your board does not want what Lisa delivers. She do not want military. Now, if you are working for the military, T4, but then your business strategy is security. My business strategy is profit. Hence, I take risks. We take risks in order to make profits. That is the whole concept of capitalism. The inverted yield curve. This is a practical tool. When I'm talking about risk appetite, I draw this on the whiteboard in the boardroom in front of the board. And I give them the marker and I go, yeah, there you go. You tell me where you want to be. That's a really, really silly board. It's a really immature board that's going to either choose P4 or P1. Can we see that? Is this making sense? A balance. You can have too much as well as too little. So you see, we have to change the way we think about it. Traditional IT security, Lisa and her team, is always going to go for maximum security. What we have to do is we have to help the board understand this. Part of our job is to train and to educate, to change the way we speak, to translate the technobabble 
into things that they can understand. You see, this is what it's really about, the balance between. We use governance, risk and compliance to do it. If we're going to help the board, we need to understand how the board operates and their goals are governance, risk and compliance. OK, three letters is it just another T GRC, just another acronym, another TLA. I mean, corporate governance drives your organization. OK, corporate governance, corporate governance sits in the middle and it drives everything that you're doing. OK, I should put in corporate governance. Whoops, let me just start that again. Corporate governance. And corporate governance is what your board wants to do. We need that to understand information security. We need that to make effective decisions. And if we're going to do it, we need to understand how it operates in order to be effective. Corporate, nobody wants corporate governance. Corporate governance is forced upon a board. Corporate governance says the people who are the senior management team are the accountable people in the business. And you see, this is why we end up with Lisa, our model. The senior team are legally accountable. Like, no one's going to volunteer to be legally accountable. It's the difference between the word accountability and the word responsibility. Legally accountable, responsible to the business. You know, if, I, if Lisa messes up, Lisa doesn't go to jail. Somebody in the board does. Because it's always the board that's legally accountable and nobody would volunteer to be legally accountable. So what we get is we get due care. And due diligence. Being implicit requirements and we get laws and regulations being explicit requirements. So you're not getting away with this. We force corporate governance on an organization. You see, this is why the business thinks they want P4. Because if they don't achieve it, they might end up in jail. So the business sits back and goes, I don't understand this problem. I don't know where the right place in the Goldilocks zone is, but I do know one thing. If the proverbial hits the fan, Lisa isn't going to jail, it's me. So the business goes, well, the least risk is P4. But it means we won't get as much profit. But because I don't understand it, because I'm accountable, I push towards P4. The green is compliance. The black is governance. And the way we're supposed to do it in real life is we're supposed to use the processes of risk. Risk proves that everything we're doing is reasonable. Due care and due diligence actually says doing what is reasonable. Laws and regulations in a courtroom is doing what is reasonable. You see, if you understand corporate governance, you don't have to stop ransomware. You don't have to stop GDPR breaches. You can't. You can't and still have a computer system that works. You have to be able to prove that what you did was reasonable. Due care, doing what is reasonable. Due diligence, proving you did what was reasonable. Due care and due diligence, laws and regulation drive the responsibilities and accountabilities of your senior team. It's your senior team that are legally accountable. Your senior team is supposed to understand the risks. And when they don't understand the risks, they become risk adverse. And when they become risk adverse, they go to Lisa, fix it. Lisa, here's fix it. And next thing you've got an IT system. That's no good to anybody. You can see where the problem comes from. You can also see what the solution is. If these people could understand what we do, if we could translate it into a different language, if we could talk about it without the technobabble, 
then they will very quickly realize, ah, I can take reasonable risk. And if I take reasonable risk, I can trust Lisa to implement reasonable controls. Information commissioner, all the laws that we have, due care and due diligence obligations, all of them are satisfied, not by absolute security, but by reasonable security. Because every single business is about acting reasonably. If you go and overtake a car and you're overtaking it on a two lane road and you have an accident, it can happen. What the police have to investigate is, were your actions reasonable? Was it reasonable? Was the road conditions, the weather conditions, the conditions of your car, the amount of time? It's not about whether or not you did it. It's whether or not it was a reason. We, we actually call it uh, burden uh, uh, beyond all reasonable doubt. B A or D in a courtroom beyond all reasonable doubt. Okay, it's always the word reasonable. Corporate governance, the means by which a managed uh, business is managed and run, it is both a legal and due care and due diligence. It is not good enough to do what is reasonable. You must prove you've done what is reasonable. Risk. Every business is supposed to be based on the language of risk. Stakeholders take a risk with their investments in order to make a return. Without taking risks, businesses would never succeed. Compliance, laws and regulations. Laws and you don't have to prevent all data breaches. You cannot prevent all data breaches. If you have a data breach, the information commissioner wants to know one thing. Did you do what was reasonable? That's the one thing that they want to know. You see, we need to understand this. Because if we educate them, change to the, educate the board, and change the way we speak to them, we can get effective decisions off them. They are responsible for governance risk compliance. And it is their duty to understand this. You see, here's one of the weaknesses. What have you done genuinely to change the way that IT and IS talk to the business to make it easier for them to understand. And what have you done to provide them a safe way to learn the fundamentals and the basics of what we do? Not far walls and ransomware, just about the risks that we take and the choices we have. You see, if we change the way we talk, if we educate the board, we can get much more effective decisions. See, your board's supposed to be doing this for everything. Financial governance, human capital governance, manufacturing governance, supply chain governance. It's supposed to do IT and IS governance. And a successful business has a successful governance model. Corporate governance is about proving we did what was reasonable. That's what your board really wants from you. To be able, if the proverbial hits the fan, to prove you took reasonable precautions. GRC makes up the responsibilities of the senior team and it's the duty of the senior team to understand GRC and their environments. One of the things I've been doing for the past 14 or 15 years is working with the leadership team and boards, mentoring them, providing non-executive directorship, providing neutral independent advice. And you see, if you don't provide that support and help, They'll go outside the company to get it. And they'll end up going to one of the big four consultancy houses. And instead of getting neutral, independent advice, they'll get sales pitches. If the person with the ear of your board that's telling them how to fix this has something to sell, 
guess what you're going to get? Whatever they have to sell. In Isaka, we believe in uh, mutually exclusive contracts. Mutually exclusive contracts. It's a powerful idea. If you provide me advice, you sign a legal contract that you are not allowed to sell me anything else. No hardware, no software, no consultancy, no audits, no pen tests, because you cannot get advice from a salesperson. Because a salesperson's job is to sell you what they have. Mutually exclusive contracts. What are you doing to support the board in giving them safe, independent, vendor neutral, mutually exclusive contract advice? If you don't do it, somebody else will. See, the senior managers must understand the business requirements, goals, and risk. They provide the strategy and direction, the sponsorship and budget, the oversight and control. We have to help them deliver that. Our goal is to understand IS, to help the management team understand IS, to gain control of IS, to effectively manage IS. And in my opinion, Look at that. Have you ever heard that one before? That good information security is a strategic business advantage. It's a strategic business advantage. The inverted yield curve tells me that. That if I do a really good job to balance that out, I get a strategic advantage in my business. Our role is to translate the complicated technical issues we deal with into a common language of understanding. Our goal is to offer the four choices in the inverted yield curve. The P1, the P2, the P3, the P4. We hope they never choose P1 and P4. We advise them not to choose P1 and P4. Words right, P2, P3. Different companies, different solutions, different risk appetites, different markets, different operating. It's different for each company, but we know it's not one or the other. To translate business decisions, they then make P1 and P2 into technical architectures. The IT function comes along to take that technical architecture and to turn it into technical controls. I have very rarely found Lisa and her IT team that couldn't do exactly what the business wants. If someone wouldn't just tell them what the business wants, they are not clairvoyant. We need to be told what the business wants. If you tell Lisa and her team, this is exactly what we want. Not too much, not too little. It needs to be in here. This is how we're going to do it in generic terms, general generic terms. Lisa and her IT team will deliver it for you, as long as they're measured on delivering it and not what happens after. it. Enable your management team in five steps. Number one, use risk processes, the last session, to translate into a shared language. We should have a shared risk report. We allow the board to compare apples with apples so that they can make effective decisions. We ensure robust management of risk, risk assessments and analysis. That's what the last session was. It's on our YouTube channel. It's about making sure that the business has a business continuity plan, knows what business impact analysis is and knows what risk is. Again, it's on the YouTube channel, it's on the last session. Number two, enable your management. Step two, offer options, not solutions. Every significant decision should have four options, a promiscuous, a permissive, a prudent, a paranoid. If you like, bronze, silver, gold, and paranoid. You're gonna bronze, silver, gold, and paranoid? Bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. That would be much 
it's more sensible, give them different choice. We rate each choice for cost, residual risk, and the impact on the business. Too much security will have a great impact on the business. The business won't be able to make a profit because it won't get a return on investment. Instead of giving yourself a strategic advantage, you're putting your business at a strategic disadvantage. It's all about a balance of controls. We translate it using, this is COVID. ISO 27000 is slightly different to this. So if you're familiar with ISO 27000, this is different. Policy standard guideline procedures. We don't define technical specifics. You see, what's supposed to happen? is we're supposed to separate governance from management, where senior people make policy decisions. I, I audit policies all the time, and I get these big, huge, thick, inch thick books. Do you know what? If a policy is over three, four, five pages, A4 pages, it is not a policy. A policy is a general idea policy is where on the inverted yield curve do you want to be it is not a technical explanation there is no technology in it there is no explicit controls in it it's a very general idea we take the very simple generic policy and we have to translate that into technical standards Techn See, policies are open to interpretation in a COVID world. In an ISO 27000 world, policies are highly technical. No, policies are for everybody in the company to read. They should be understandable by everybody. There should be no techno babble in them. They should be short and concise. Standards, that's where we put our techno babble. Standards are highly specific and highly technical. In actual fact, they are so highly specific and so highly technical, very few people can understand them. In actual fact, they are so technical, we need to provide translations of the standards into helpful, fluffy guidelines. We take a simple policy, convert it into a highly specific and measurable standard, and then we create such a complicated standard, guidance needs to be provided. Guidance translates the cold, hard, technical standards into friendly, fluffy things that users can read and understand. Policies go into standard guidelines, and then finally, finally, we get SOPs, procedures, standard operating procedures. And you know what this is supposed to be? It's supposed to be the senior management team, IS, and IT. And you can see we're translating this vague policy into specific technical standards and guidelines, but it's still IT that implements. You see, we've created an IS function that sits in the middle, that's not part of an IT team. And the IS function's job is to make sure we get that balance right, because if we get the balance right, we're more profitable. We have a competitive advantage. It's all about that competitive advantage that we can give ourselves. This is the PSG model out of COVID. It separates management from IS from IT. We must allow IT to do their job. Lisa and the team, they're brilliant technically. We don't need two technical teams. My IS team doesn't do a far one. That's Lisa and the team. My IS team doesn't configure SQL databases. That's Lisa and the team. We need to let IT get on with the job. We allow IT to do their job. IT selects the best vendor and product. IT implements the solution. IT manages the solution. We come in as the architects. 
That's really what Colbert wants us to be. Architects. People who can understand business requirements, business needs, and to translate those into technical deliveries that your IT team can roll out. This is a COVID-based information security model. Business needs assurance. They need confidence. Well, to get it wrong, they go to jail. So they want confidence they're not going to jail. So the, I, the management team want us to measure success. And we measure success using vulnerability scans, pen tests, and audits. These measure my success. Not the number of successful attacks. Use IT, there'll be successful attacks. It's not, it's not the number of attacks we block. It's not the number of successful attacks. The only way to measure success is through vulnerability scans, pen tests, and audits. No matter how good a driver you are, no matter how careful you are, no matter how well you maintain your car, you can still get hit. You can still get paid at a junction. You need to prove not that you avoided the accident. You need to prove that you did what was reasonable. And these are the tests that we measure our success by. And we have to communicate that to the board. The board must accept. You want to use IT, there will be risk. And that risk means we will lose data, we will have outages, we will lose personal data. We try to minimize it. But if you want to use IT, you must accept the inherent risk. This was our opening question. What issues prevent your board from delivering effective information security? What your leadership team really want? They want help to deliver the, whoa, sorry. They want help to deliver a business strategy, not for you to secure IT. They want help to understand the issues, not for you to tell them what to do. This is what they really want. That is my conclusion. It's good, isn't it? And it made. Because that's what we're supposed to do in IS. And if we get that balance right, if we get into that Goldilocks zone, strategic advantage to our business, more profit means bigger bonuses and more salary all around. Well, it does if you work for the right company. Because the right company is supposed to reward success, isn't it? That is my conclusion. In actual fact, that could have been the entire session this time. That could have been the entire. If I wanted to use one slide, I could have presented this entire session. Because look, at it, it's cool, isn't it? That and the inverted yield curve. I only needed two slides. Really. What did you make a waste of the time with the rest of them for? I only needed two slides, really. That on the inverted yield curve. Achieving what your leadership team wants from IS. Look, this is COVID. COVID says your senior people need to come up with a strategy where we are in the inverted yield curve. We take it, we turn it into architecture and design. And we take the architecture and design, and it's the IT team that deliver it. Strategy really is policy. Design is really standards and guidelines, and the IT department delivers step-by-step -step configurations, standard operating procedures. And then we measure success on the way back. We measure it using key goals, key performance indicators, audits and pen tests. We then take and aggregate this into critical success factors and dashboards, and we try to report to the senior management team strategic achievement. COVID puts us on the middle, and our job, if you just stand in front of the board and do that lots, if that's really what they want. They want you to help them to understand to get that balance right. And if you get the balance right, you give your business a strategic achievement. Or if you work in the public sector or not for profit, you deliver an effective, efficient service.
that's value for money. It's the same thing. Mm. Title of the session was to help your board get a grip on IS and cyber risk. Okay. Uh, are we over in time or my timing's off today? Johan? What are we left on this one? Okay, can you remember? Okay. Uh, what we wanted to do was to deliver some real learning with no sales and no marketing. And hopefully you might agree with us that we've at least tried to do that. If you appreciate what we've done, if you if you like what we've done for you, you might consider leaving us a review on Google or maybe following us online on LinkedIn. OK, we are a boutique specialist in information security and cyber training business in the United Kingdom. We've been helping organizations of all sizes since 2009 to get control and build value models from information security. We're always here and happy to help. If you need any more help or support or want to get in contact, we get our URL and our email address. But for me in this session, that is us coming towards the end. Uh, any questions, any feedback from today's session? Johan? Oh. Sean, Johan's on mute. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Uh, I will go and try to sort that out. OK, uh, let's go and see. Can we find our account? Take me a few short seconds to go and do that because there's lots of people on this session. So apologies about that. Uh, let's see if I can find it. I'll unmute her now. Allow Mike. Apologies about that one. We missed that one somehow. Don't know how we managed. It must have got disconnected. Uh, early one. Yeah, my so, fault. I got disconnected in the middle, Sean. So sorry about no that. No problem at all. This happens. Okay. Um, if you think you've got a problem, the heat. I, I'm in here. There's about, I would say, twelve or thirteen thousand aluminums of light in here, and the heating came on in my house about an hour and a half ago, and it's like a sauna in here now. I mean, I don't know if you can see the light, but the amount of lights in this room is ridiculous, and it's really quite. Woof. Sorry. Please go ahead. But we've got a question for you from Alan. Just do these sessions have any CPD or CPE points? Yes, they do. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, look, CPEs and CPDs are continuing education points that you need for certain certifications like CIS, like CISM, CISA, Certified Ethical Hacking. Now, it depends on the provider. Some providers that we don't deal with, like SANS, say no. The only way you can get points is to pay us money and come on our courses. Most providers like the EC Council and ISACA will allow you to claim points for these sessions. So we will provide a course completion certificate with my name, with the title of the course and the duration, and you should be able with most providers to claim CEPs for that. And if you need help, we're here to do that. Good question. Thanks for that one, Alan. Keep going, any more? Uh, no other questions, um, just comments and that it was really helpful. OK, OK. How do we do for time in that one? We've got another 20 minutes on the schedule. Oh, 20 minutes. They, they don't want 20 more minutes on inverted yield curves, trust me. <laughs> Has anybody got to use? Okay, here's a good question for you before you go, before we finish up. Genuine question. If there's one thing to take away, the inverted yield curve, I mean, does anybody see themselves actually going and using it? Because I have used it. I've used it in multiple different scenarios in different boards of different countries. It works. Can anybody see themselves using it? Any comments? Anybody think they'll actually go in and try this out and see it work? What are we getting on the chat box? Yeah, um, Max thinks they can certainly use it. Yeah, I, I think it's a highly useful tool. I really, really do. Folks, look, I hope that you learned something from this session. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, the 
sessions will be up on our YouTube channel very soon. Uh, we'll be doing a draw for the prizes that we've used, that we've come up with as well. Uh, I know Johan has put in some links down there. Uh, the free thing that we're looking for, it's from a charity organisation, the, the uh, prize this week. So even if you're not interested in the prize that we're offering, maybe you could check out the charity website. Very useful charity if you need any promotional items. It allows you to do promotional items to do a little bit of extra good in the background rather than just free giveaways. So really nice little plug there uh, for the provider of off the bag. And the name of that company was Madlog, isn't that right? Yeah, that's right, Madlog. Make a difference Mad luggage. Make a difference luggage. You really should check it out if you want any freebies or anything. Very useful little uh, charity to get involved with. But folks, for me in these sessions, and if you attended all four, well done, hats off. I think that's enough of me for today. Well, with one last question, if you've got another 30 seconds in your show. Of course I have. Barry would like to know, do you see regulators pushing companies towards the P4 control level, whether they want to or not, especially in finance sectors? Mm -hmm. You do, wow, we've had this a lot. We've had this a lot. The regulator, could we've asked the regulator this question, the answer was no. The problem is the auditors you get in, and it's not the regulator pushing it. You see, the way regulation works in FinTech is the government sets up a regulator, it sets up a standard to achieve, and then you have to pay licensed auditors to come in to measure it. And it's those licensed auditors are becoming the issue. The auditors are trying to push you towards P4 because that's what they think the government works. But the regulator does not want P4 because you, you wouldn't have an effective finance industry. Other countries would overtake our finance industry. We can't have that. So no. Our problem and your problem usually is the interpretation of it. And the interpretation is usually down to the audit firm that's invited in to test you, did you meet the level? The regulators, we've had pushed back a lot of the time. And if you get a bad auditor from a regulator, because once every three years you should get a regulator audit. If it's a regulator audit you're talking about, you need to sit down and you need to push back. We've had this conversation because we've heard this story before. We've heard this story where regulators themselves are not understanding what they're trying to implement, what they're trying to achieve. But we've asked them that question and the answer is no. They shouldn't be doing it. They don't want to do it. If you think you're pushing towards P4, you need to sit down and have that conversation with your regulator. They're decent people. They're there to listen as well as to tell you what to do. It's about that relationship you build with the regulator, isn't it? I've heard that one before, Barry, that, that is an issue with some of my customers. When we've asked that question, no, they want the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone for a bank loan will be in a different place than for a manufacturing company or a dentist. So you will be signed, but it's still the Goldilocks zone they want. Good question, that one. Very specific. Any other ones, Johan? No, that's it. Just lots and lots of comments coming in that it was really useful, practical, and someone in the charity sector that's going to be able to use the inverted curve. Inverted <laughs> yield inverted curve. Yield curve. <laughs> <laughs> we should get inverted yield curve t-shirts done up. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Folks, look, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful. You know where we are if you need any more help or support. But for me for today, look, stay safe. Hope you enjoyed it. See you back in the next one. See you later. Bye-bye.